Ryan Blaney wins. Corey LaJoy is going to be the talk of the week. And Pocono has a ton of traffic issues. Welcome back to Break Hard. I'm Matt. Let's talk about the second biggest thing to happen in Pennsylvania this past weekend, the Pocono 400 or whatever random name they're going to give it this time around. Ryan Blaney comes out victorious, picks up his second NASCAR Cup Series win of the season and kind of cements himself as a guy that might be in play for, well, his second championship at this rate. It was a pretty interesting race top to bottom, not going to lie. For Pocono standards, it was fine. It was middle of the road, the Mendoza line, the Eric Almirola of races. It wasn't very memorable, wasn't very forgettable. Well, I guess it probably is more forgettable than it actually was anything else but the race started off pretty hot pretty strong ty gibbs shot out of the gate well if you're actually there for the start of the race because a lot of fans were stuck miles away from the racetrack gridlocked in traffic as the authorities and the track officials have absolutely failed everybody around the racetrack on sunday as most of them sat gridlocked in traffic some people even got out of their cars walked to the racetrack at that point but we'll talk about that in another video at some other time they did their best 2011 kentucky impression and it just was not something that you should ever do an impression of Ty Gibbs, though, at the start of the race, absolutely shot out. It got out to a four-second lead. He looked like the Eagles in the regular season, and then when it mattered, his engine exploded, and oil was coming out of the tailpipes, and kind of looked like the Eagles whenever they make it to the playoffs. So, not exactly ideal uh, for them there. Really interesting strategy race overall um, when we saw people saving immediately as soon as the race started. I mean, rolling off a pit road, they were telling drivers, save as much as you can under the pace laps. Uh, Noah Graxon brings out the first caution of the day. He backs it into the wall harder than Rocky could actually punch anybody ever bad day for him but good news he did sign a deal with front row motorsports so that was you know the the highlight of his week tell me the peach in the pit of your week or the rose in the thorn or whatever the heck your hinge date or whatever girl you're talking to or man or woman i'm not here to judge on that i mean heck ralph schumacher today absolutely curbing stereotypes but yeah, for Noah, not a great day for him overall. On the ensuing restart, Josh Berry hopped out of line, hoping to avoid disaster like it was Pirates baseball season. He did avoid said disaster, made it to pit road, changed all the tires, and actually did. The strategy worked out pretty well for him until the end of the race when he overshot his pit box, and that kind of ruined the rest of the race for them. At one point during stage one, Zane Smith was making passes into the top 10, and I thought that he was about to have his Brady Anderson type of season, or you know, race rather. And I know that's a Maryland reference, but it's close enough to Pennsylvania, I'm going to go ahead and use it right here for Zane though it wouldn't matter because later in the race well he would meet his his maker that means John Hunter Nemechek so moving on the actual stage one and stage two had some pretty interesting varying strategies to it we had some drivers pitting to you know uh, continue not, not worried about stage points we had other drivers that took the stage points and everything like that stage two the top 10 basically got flipped we had Brad Keselowski and others basically taking up the entire top 10 from that point on and then you had Denny and Chase and the other fast guys having to work their way back up through the field, which is pretty intriguing. And for Brad, it actually ended up paying off for him because he gets a top 10 out of the day. So that was all to start stage two, and we kind of had the top 10 flip over right there. That was until, well, Ross Chastain decided to bust his peach, leaving the exit of turn six or turn three or whatever number you want to give it at this racetrack. His day was done after that. Puts him in a really precarious spot now for his, you know, playoff hopes and chances and heading into that there's five races to go he still has a 27 point lead over Bubba Wallace but he lost a lot of ground on Sunday which obviously is not ideal for him him bringing out that caution though then kind of flips the strategy around a little bit you have Denny and Chase pitting with Brad Keselowski and all those other guys that had stayed out so now they're all on the same strategy but then you have Ty Gibbs and Todd Gillen and a, a couple others staying out so now you have two different strategies when before we kind of had three different strategies so if you're keeping track of all of it it's like okay who's going to make this work into stage three rather who's gonna have the cautions fall their way right and then as stage two is winding down right there you have Carson Hosevar and Todd Gillen getting into it you know once again here Hosevar tries to slam the door on him on the exit of turn one or two or however again you want to number that and Todd was just not having it at all did not lift he kind of hooks Carson a little bit while Carson goes up to chop him smacks off the wall some there for Todd is unfortunate because his day would come to an end a little bit later on as he would lose his brakes off into turn one and just put the car against the wall but in stage two, Denny Hamlin would go on to win the stage. Chase Elliott would come in second. And Chase probably could have... Chase at that point was faster than Denny, but... Alan Gustafson on the pit box knew that they weren't going to get to Denny in time, so he told Chase to just max save fuel and just, you know, come home second, essentially. So then, after stage three gets started, that's when Todd Gillen eventually does lose his brakes on lap 115. He goes into the wall, puts himself into the wall, and then we have pit stops happen at that point. And then we have four drivers get all flagged for speeding in the same section on pit road, that being Kyle Larson, Chase Elliott, Ty Gibbs, and uh, Daniel Suarez all got tagged for speeding underneath the same pit stop sequence, all in the same section. 
section. And Alan Gus, or not Alan Gustafson, but rather Cliff Daniels was just not happy about it at all. He thinks that NASCAR changed the timing lines, recalibrated, did something uh, from that time because even during the parade laps at the start of the race, when everybody came down to check their pit road speed, I believe 33 cars all registered as going too fast in that segment. So there's definitely something up there all day. Multiple people got hit in that same section. So maybe before next year, that should be looked at once again because that was a lot of cars for it to just be one car that was a little bit off there. So Cliff and Kyle kind of went back and forth on the radio, not mad at each other, just both being kind of perplexed by the entire situation and then, you know, agreed to move on after that. But then on that ensuing restart is going to be the most talked about, you know, moment of the entire race that will be talked about throughout this entire week going off into turn one. Of course, it's Pocono. Everybody spreads out really wide. Kyle Busch looked like he was going to be on the very far inside there and he kind of blocks Corey LaJoy getting down there being like, no, you're not going to go underneath me. We're already at our max capacity for going into this corner. And then Corey decides to just come back up the racetrack and he just hooks Kyle Busch in the left rear, turns Kyle, sends him off into turn one, up into the rest of the traffic that's about to come through that corner. And Kyle ends up collecting Daniel Hemrick uh, and a number of other drivers, Ryan Priest, Ricky Stenhouse Jr., just collects a lot of guys, Harrison Burton, in this, all because Corey LaJoy kind of appeared to throw a bit of a hissy fit right there. And that's unfortunate, right? Because Corey LaJoy ran through him like Jerome Bettis runs through the offensive line, and there's absolutely no need for it. He's been hanging out with Carson Hosovar too much at this point because he just, like I said, straight up hooks the guy. And then he comes on the radio and he was like, the eight hooked himself on the nose of me, he boxed me once, boxed me twice, that's what he gets type of situation. Listen, I hope somebody shows this Muppet a replay after the race, because even after the race, he was still vehemently saying that the eight hooked himself when you can look at it on the video. And even in the still shot right here, the seven is turned back up the racetrack, turned right on the straightaway into the eight, hooks the eight, spins him down the racetrack. Kyle Busch just looks like he is absolutely entirely checked out of this season. I know he wants his win streak to continue. I want to see his win streak continue because I think it's one of those records that probably won't be beat in NASCAR, at least not for a very long time. And it's just does not appear that it is going to happen at this rate because the guy constantly keeps getting caught up in other people's nonsense. I mean, heck, today Kyle Busch got passed by Cody Ware on speed. That's how bad that number eight car is. Kyle Busch hasn't lost it. That eight car and that entire RCR program is just bad right now. Even the three car was back there running in the 30s. Just not a banner day for the people over at RCR. Not a banner day for Corey LaJoy either because now he's heading into a 2025 season where he's got all the resources. He's got a top tier crew chief in Rodney Childers. And he continually cannot make mistakes like this. And he talks like uh, he's a guy that's gone out here and won a bunch of races before, but guys never won a race in NASCAR's top three series. And then going out and pulling things like this certainly isn't going to make people happy. You're not going to be stacking pennies. As the internet was saying after his wreck on Sunday, he's going to be out there stacking burgers because you can't keep doing things like this and expect to keep your job. And considering you don't win or haven't even ever got a top 10 finish on a non-drafting track, just not a banner day for for Corey LaJoy. I was actually surprised there weren't people lined up outside the seven hauler like Ricky Stenhouse Jr. Uh, at North Wilkesboro. It's going to be Harrison Burton, Ricky, throw uh, throw Ryan Priest in there as well. Just guys waiting. Harrison, of course, is never going to fight anybody. But yeah, Corey just made, man, that was a dumb, dumb decision. The seventh caution of the day was brought out when John Hunter Nemechek and Zane Smith both push up the racetrack, hit the 34 car of Michael McDowell. They went spinning across the racetrack, hit the inside wall. Not ideal for, for either of them. Side note here, John Hunter Nemechek has over a million subscribers on YouTube. Absolutely banana numbers. He doesn't actually get that many views on his actual like long form videos. 20,000 is the most views he's ever gotten on an actual video, but his shorts, one of his shorts has like 600 million views on it. Just crazy numbers for him. So Shout out to him for getting a million subscribers. That's pretty awesome. Ty Gibbs, after that, would blow up on the next restart. Uh, I saw some people complaining about him not getting to the apron fast enough into turn one on the restart. I mean, with the amount of fluid that he was dropping, he tries to just go down on the apron like that. He probably spins out. So he did the right thing there. Just... <laughs> Water and oil do not mix together well, and as Steve LaTarte pointed out, when they do mix together, they kind of look like Yoohoo, the drink, if you've ever had that. Not the best tasting thing that you could ever put in your body, but that's what it did look like, and it was just pouring out of the tailpipes of that number 54 car. Don't see things like that happen very often. Even Ty came to the radio, and he was like, this thing grenaded. Yeah, don't see massive failures like that too often anymore. And then after that, it was pretty much just a run to the finish. 
Ryan Blaney got out front. Alex Bowman kind of slotted in and second behind him. Denny Hamlin eventually got around the 48 of Bowman. And that was all that she wrote. The 12 sails off to victory. Blaney picks up his second win at Pocono, his 12th career victory overall to match his car number, number 12 there. Roger Penske also picked up a win in IndyCar on Sunday as well with the number 12 car of Will Power. Got a really, really lucky caution um, Power to go Power's way. He ends up picking up the victory as well. Penske won three races this weekend, including Saturday night with Scott McLaughlin at Iowa. So just a real Penske weekend, and everybody loves to see it, I guess, if you're a Penske fan. Hey, at least those guys that call into Dorman Clear won't have to throw their toaster into the bathtub this weekend because, well, things worked out pretty well for him this time. So for Blaney, like I said at the beginning, he kind of cements himself there as being one of those contenders to make it to the Final Four right now, and the Fords have certainly turned it on in recent weeks. I think they've won five of the last nine and then throw the All-Star race in there as well. Things are really turning up Blue Oval right now after they were looking absolutely terrible at the beginning of the season so let me know in the comments what you think about the race this past weekend like and subscribe to the channel follow me on tiktok at break hard instagram and twitter at break hard blog